Bonjour et bienvenue à une nouvelle capsule éthérique de Montréal Hanté. Je suis votre hôte Dr Mab et aujourd'hui pour célébrer l'Halloween, nous allons parler d'un des plus grands magiciens de l'histoire et de son fantôme. Montréal Hanté offre des promenades thématiques, une tournée des bars et des recherches sur les phénomènes de hantise de Montréal et de la région. Pour participer ou pour en savoir plus, vous pouvez suivre les liens dans la description. Et maintenant, parlons fantômes. Harry Houdini, jadis connu comme le plus grand magicien du monde, fut un homme très mystérieux. Son lien avec Montréal, aussi fort que tragique. Il scella son sort en effet dans la ville au Théâtre Princess le 22 octobre 1926, lors d'une tournée. Suivant un incident avec un étudiant de l'Université McGill dans sa loge, la santé du magicien se mit à dépérir. Bien qu'il tenta de continuer sa tournée, il mourut à peine une semaine plus tard dans un hôpital de Détroit, à l'Halloween quand même. Aujourd'hui, les rumeurs courent que son fantôme a différents sites à travers l'Amérique du Nord, incluant Montréal. Harry Houdini naquit le 24 mars 1874 à Budapest, en Hongrie. Ses parents, un rabbin et sa femme, l'avaient nommé Eric. Sa famille déménagea alors qu'il était encore enfant à Appleton, au Wisconsin, où il passa son enfance. Quand il eut 13 ans, il suivit sa famille à New York. C'est là que le générique s'intéressa aux arts du trapèze et à la magie. En 1894, il prit le pseudonyme Harry Houdini, en hommage au grand magicien français Jean-Eugène Robert Houdin. Et sa carrière de magicien professionnel débuta. Bien que sa magie trouva peu de succès au départ, ses exploits d'évasion de menottes attirèrent l'attention. Son assistante Vélimina Beatrice Raner tomba amoureuse de lui et l'épousa. Son nom de scène comme assistante était Bess Houdini. En 1899, son numéro capta l'attention de Martin Beck, un agent, qui lui réserva la scène de quelques-uns des meilleurs théâtres de vaudeville des États-Unis, et, sur les talons du succès, une tournée européenne suivit. Les exploits d'Ozini impliquaient souvent la police locale, qui le fouillait, le menottait et l'emprisonnait. À chaque fois, il s'évadait. Ses spectacles firent grande sensation et il devint le magicien le mieux payé sur la scène du vaudeville. Houdini continua ses tournées aux États-Unis au début des années 1900, poussant plus loin les limites. Il s'évada de menottes, de camisoles de force, de citernes d'eau et même de caisses clouées. Une fois, il passa 91 minutes dans un cercueil galvanisé qui était surmergé au fond d'une piscine d'un hôtel. En utilisant sa force étonnante et son impressionnante capacité à crocheter les serrures, il s'évada de multitudes de situations dangereuses. Son exploit le plus fameux dévoilé en 1912 était la cellule chinoise de torture par l'eau, numéro durant lequel Houdini était suspendu par les chevilles et plongé dans un cabinet de verre verrouillé et rempli d'eau. Dans cette sorte d'aquarium, Houdini devait retenir son souffle plus de trois minutes afin de s'échapper. Le numéro était jugé très osé et il plaisait beaucoup aux foules. Ainsi, il demeura la marque de ses spectacles jusqu'à sa mort en 1926. En grand illusionniste, Houdini était impliqué dans un débat passionné qui avait lieu à l'époque au sujet de la pratique du spiritisme, la croyance que les morts avaient la capacité de communiquer avec les vivants. Les croyants voient le monde des esprits comme un lieu où ceux-ci sont actifs et continuent d'évoluer. Le spiritisme était si populaire entre 1840 et 1920 qu'il est considéré comme une partie de la sous-culture victorienne. Il se composait de médiums, de revues spécialisées, de brochures, de traités et de sociétés secrètes. 
Les séances publiques et privées incluaient des coups de table, de l'écriture automatique, des lévitations et d'autres types de communication avec les esprits. Le spiritisme était surtout populaire dans les pays anglo-saxons et trouva ses disciples dans les classes moyennes et bourgeoises. Certaines des personnes les plus influentes pratiquaient le spiritisme. La reine Victoria et son mari, le prince Albert, participèrent à des séances dès 1846. Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, le créateur de Sherlock Holmes, y adhérait. Même le premier ministre canadien William Lyon Mackenzie King communiquait avec les esprits, dit-on. Houdini, malgré le fait d'être le plus fameux des musiciens, n'avait jamais cru au spiritisme, quoi qu'il eût dit le vouloir. Quand sa mère mourut en 1913, elle laissa une forte impression sur lui avec sa dernière parole « Forgive, pardonne ». Il commença à visiter un bon nombre de médiums en essayant de recevoir la confirmation que l'esprit de sa mère existait dans un autre monde. Toutefois, plus il assistait aux séances, plus il croyait que les médiums étaient des fumistes qui profitaient de la vulnérabilité des gens. Aucun parmi ceux qu'il avait visités n'avait pu répéter la dernière parole de sa mère, ce qui était suffisant pour le convaincre que ce mouvement était faux. Houdini décida d'utiliser ses talents d'illusionnisme et d'exposer les trucs sournois utilisés par les médiums sans scrupules qui détroussaient les clients en deuil. Il dénonça ses charlatans et acquit des partisans peu nombreux mais très passionnés. La position d'Houdini causa des ruptures dans le mouvement spiritiste, mettant même fin à certaines amitiés. Son ami Conan Doyle était convaincu qu'Houdini possédait un pouvoir de dématérialisation malgré les protestations du magicien. Leur relation s'envenima quand Houdini se mit à dénoncer les médiums sur scène et dans la revue Scientific American. Conan Doyle fut dévasté quand Houdini exposa à la médium bostonnaise Marjorie Crandon, une blonde attrayante connue aussi sous le nom de la sorcière blonde de la rue Lyme. Elle joua souvent nue et apparemment sécrétait de l'ectoplasme de son sexe. Houdini, qui regardait son spectacle, observa ses tours de passe-passe et exposa en public la fraude. Quand Houdini annonça aux spectateurs de la séance que tout était monté, Marjorie et son guide Spirit Walter étaient furieux. « Houdini, fils de pute !» lui cria Walter. « Je te lance un sort qui te suivra tous les jours du restant de ta courte vie. » Cette menace ne dissuada en rien Houdini qui exposa davantage comment Marjorie accomplissait ses tours. Peu après, Houdini ne tenait pas seulement la carrière de Marjorie par le coup, mais tout le mouvement spiritiste. En août 1926, Walter déclara « Houdini sera mort d'ici un an ». Quand Rundle interpréta la mission de Houdini de démasquer les médiums et dénoncer le spiritisme comme une trahison personnelle, leur amitié dégénéra en brouille avec attaque par revue interposée. Outre ce conflit, Harry Houdini continua ses spectacles de magie à travers l'Amérique du Nord, jouissant de gloire et fortune, le propre du plus grand magicien du monde. Toutefois, la malédiction lancée sur lui par Walter allait poindre à Montréal en octobre quand un incident inattendu mettra fin à la carrière si estimée du magicien et à sa vie. L'après-midi du 22 octobre 1926, Houdini relaxait dans sa loge au Théâtre Princess à Montréal sur la rue Sainte-Catherine avant son spectacle du soir. Il fut visité par deux étudiants de McGill qui étaient curieux d'en savoir plus sur ses prétendus pouvoirs magiques. L'un d'eux, J. Gordon Whitehead, lui demanda si c'était vrai qu'il pouvait soutenir tout coup au vent, tel que le magicien avait déjà proclamé. Houdini répliqua que oui. Soudainement, le jeune étudiant lui livra quatre coups aux tripes avant que le magicien puisse serrer ses muscles. Son appendice déchiré, la santé commence à vite à lui faillir. Durant la soirée, Houdini performa dans une douleur exécrable. Il fut incapable de dormir et souffrit de douleurs constantes pour les deux prochains jours en voyage à Détroit, toujours en tournée. Quand il accepta enfin de l'aide médicale, on lui découvrit une appendicite et une fièvre de 38 degrés. Le médecin l'avisa d'aller à l'hôpital pour une intervention chirurgicale immédiate, mais Houdini décida de compléter son premier spectacle, tel que prévu, au Théâtre Garrick le 24 octobre. Au lever du rideau, la fièvre de Houdini s'élevait à 40 degrés. 
Malgré l'aide de ses assistants, il était visiblement en douleur et épuisé. Il rata plusieurs signaux et semblait pressé de finir son spectacle. Vers le milieu du troisième acte, ne pouvant continuer, il demanda qu'on baisse le rideau. Houdini s'effondra en coulisses et fut transporté dans sa loge par ses assistants. Entêté, il continua de refuser l'aide médicale jusqu'au lendemain matin. Sa femme le poussait pour qu'il aille à l'hôpital. Houdini céda enfin et fut admis à l'hôpital Grace Central de Détroit, où les médecins retirèrent vite son appendice. Toutefois, il n'avait pas trop d'espoir en sa survie. Quelques jours plus tard, le 31 octobre, Harry Houdini, entouré de sa femme et de son frère, mourut dans la chambre 401. Il avait promis un message d'outre-tombe à sa femme si c'était possible. Ses dernières paroles furent « Je suis là de me battre ». Il mourut à 13h26 d'un empoisonnement sceptique dû à l'appendice déchiré, ce qui en fit une Halloween macabre. Ces obsèques eurent lieu le 4 novembre 1926 à Queens, New York, au cimetière Mark Pella. Plus de 2000 endeuillés y assistèrent. Le sceau des magiciens américains fut gravé sur sa pierre tombale et la cérémonie de la baguette brisée fut célébrée. Ce rituel est célébré lors d'obsèques de magicien. Une baguette est brisée signifiant le départ du magicien. La baguette a perdu sa magie. Jusqu'à ce jour, la Société des magiciens américains continue de tenir ce rituel annuellement à la tombe de Houdini. Sa mort tragique à l'Halloween et sa promesse de communiquer de l'outre-tombe, même s'il était lui-même sceptique, a soulevé plus d'un sourcil. Il fallut peu de temps avant que des centaines de voyants se mettent à dire qu'il recevait des massages du feu magicien. En plus, l'année suivante, Bess organisa une séance le soir de l'Halloween dans une tentative de ramener au dîner. Cette tradition continue aujourd'hui. Une séance est tenue quelque part dans le monde à chaque Halloween pour tenter de communiquer avec Houdini. En 2017, la séance a eu lieu à Halifax, en Nouvelle-Écosse. La lecture contradictoire du discours d'Houdini sur le spiritisme, joint à ses prétendus pouvoirs magiques et le fait qu'il mourut à l'Halloween, ont produit plusieurs hypothèses sur son fantôme. Bien que plusieurs ne croient pas qu'il soit devenu fantôme, d'autres croient qu'il est en différents endroits en Amérique du Nord. Une première hypothèse place le spectre à Los Angeles. Richard et Debbie Sennett, des chasseurs de fantômes, croient qu'il entre un vieil escalier dans un manoir en ruine sur le boulevard Laurel Canyon à Hollywood. Le manoir Houdini, situé au 2400 Laurel Canyon, brûla en 1959, après que les trois grands quotidiens de Los Angeles eurent parlé de l'incendie du vieux manoir Houdini, des visiteurs se mirent à dire avoir vu son fantôme. Il décrivait des orbes lumineux qui dardaient à travers les arbres sur la colline derrière les fondations du vieux manoir. Houdini avait habité sur Laurel Canyon en 1919 lors du tournage de deux films pour Lasky Famous Players et il nageait dans la piscine du manoir somptueux. Il avait dit que Hollywood était son endroit favori et que les neuf mois qu'il y restait avaient été le temps le plus heureux de sa vie. Son fantôme est-il revenu pour s'en souvenir? La seconde hypothèse situe son fantôme à Niagara Falls, en Ontario. Dans le livre Shadows of Niagara, John Savoy raconte qu'en 1968, sur Clifton Hill, le Houdini Magical Hall of Fame ouvrit ses portes, montrant l'attirail du fameux magicien de l'évasion. L'important trésor avait été légué au frère de Houdini, lui aussi magicien, sous le nom de Dash Harding. Houdini lui avait donné l'ordre de brûler le tout pour qu'on puisse découvrir ses secrets, mais Hardin, lui, ne voulait rien détruire de ses biens. Il les conserva dans un entrepôt près de 40 ans. Éventuellement, ces biens que Houdini utilisait dans ses spectacles furent vendus au hall de Houdini à Niagara Falls et exposés. Selon sa voix, lors des premières années d'activité du musée, il y eut une série de six incendies, un vol et un incident étrange durant lequel un des directeurs marcha droit dans une vitre. Il semblait que Houdini lui-même témoignait son déplaisir envers le musée. Sa voix mentionne aussi les nombreuses séances qui ont été tenues chaque année pour voir si l'esprit de Houdini reviendrait. 
À chaque fois, les séances étaient moins efficaces que les années passées. Puis enfin, en 1974, Anne Fisher, une voyante, persuada Houdini de se manifester et que ce serait la dernière séance s'il refusait. Soudainement, un pot de fleurs tomba par terre et un livre sur Houdini suivi et s'ouvrit à une page le montrant sur une affiche intitulée « Les esprits reviennent-ils ». En 1995, le fantôme de Houdini fut blâmé pour l'incendie qui ravagea le bâtiment. Presque tous les objets y ont été détruits par le feu, réalisant le souhait final du magicien. Le bâtiment abrite maintenant Replays for the Moving Theater, mais selon le personnel, il y a de l'activité paranormale présente là toujours, telles des voix des incarnés qui font peur aux gardiens de nuit. Le fantôme de Houdini entre il toujours Niagara Falls en étant fâché de l'irrespect envers ses derniers souhaits? La troisième hypothèse suggère que l'esprit de Houdini soit resté à Détroit après sa mort. Certains croient qu'il hante le bâtiment David Stock, situé sur le même site que le théâtre Garrick, démoli en 1928. D'autres rumeurs placent le fantôme dans le bâtiment qui abritait la maison funéraire où le magicien fut embaumé. Et d'autres encore pensent qu'il serait plus réaliste de dire qu'il hante le vieil hôpital Grace Central, sur les lieux duquel se tient aujourd'hui le Harper Professional Building. L'hôpital était, après tout, le seul endroit duquel Houdini n'a pu s'échapper. Y est-il resté après sa mort? La quatrième hypothèse place le fantôme dans Greenwich Village à New York. Dans le livre Haunted Greenwich Village, au chapitre 20, intitulé « L'évasion de l'au-delà », L'auteur Tom Ogden explique que Houdini entre la vieille brasserie McSorley. Fondée par un immigrant irlandais ayant survécu à la Grande Famine, la taverne accueillait certaines des personnes les plus célèbres de l'Amérique, telles que Teddy Roosevelt, Abraham Lincoln, E. Cummings, Brendan Behan, Woody Guthrie et même John Lennon. Houdini aimait fréquenter l'établissement new-yorkais entre ses tournées ce qui mène Ogden à croire que son fantôme a toujours cette buvette. La preuve, une paire de menottes ayant peut-être appartenu à Houdini, est attachée au rail luisant du bar. Le fantôme reviendrait à son bar favori sous la forme d'un chat noir assis à la fenêtre avant de disparaître. Une dernière hypothèse, finalement, situe son fantôme à Montréal où ses derniers jours commencèrent. Le vieux théâtre Princess, où le magicien reçut ses coups fatals, était situé au 480 de la rue Saint-Catherine-Ouest. Le théâtre fut construit en 1908 pour les spectacles de vaudeville, de burlesque, les opérettes et autres jeux scéniques. En 1915, un incendie le détruisit complètement, mais il fut rebâti deux ans plus tard avec une façade en terracotta. C'était dans la seconde version du bâtiment qu'Houdini connut son sort. En 1963, le Princess fut renommé le Parisien et subit des rénovations majeures. En 1974, le théâtre ferma pour d'autres rénovations et ouvrit plus tard comme cinéma à cinq écrans. Le Parisien accueillit le premier festival des films du monde à Montréal, un des plus vieux festivals de films au Canada. Du temps que c'était un cinéma, les rumeurs couraient que le fantôme de Houdini hantait l'endroit. Le personnel avait même rapporté par trois fois l'avoir vu avec un haut de forme et une cape. En 2002, un incendie détruisit un auditorium et endommagea les six autres. Enfin, le cinéma ferma ses portes à jamais le 12 avril 2007 après avoir servi comme cinéma bon marché, jouant des films en français. Le fantôme du magicien y trouva-t-il la fin de son sort? Ces jours-ci, le bâtiment est depuis longtemps loué et les rumeurs persistent que Houdini entre en droit. Trouver un locataire sera probablement difficile. On ne peut le nier, Houdini inspire encore les artistes et les magiciens à ce jour. Dans la culture populaire, les histoires du fantôme de Houdini continuent d'influer les créatifs. En 2011, un groupe canadien nommé Punch Drunk Cabaret écrivait une chanson intitulée The Ghost of Harry Houdini. En 2017-18, le musée McCord à Montréal a réalisé une exposition montrant quelques affiches de Houdini intitulées « Illusion, l'art de la magie ». Bien qu'en fin de compte, on ne sache si le fantôme de Houdini est revenu, il y a sûrement maintes hypothèses sur les villes qui l'entrent. 
Puisqu'il fut considéré comme le plus grand magicien de tous les temps, peut-être continue-t-il d'apparaître et de disparaître à des endroits variés à travers l'Amérique du Nord. S'il est en effet un fantôme, les chances favorisent Montréal, car c'est là que son sort fut scellé par les coups fatals de l'étudiant de McGill. Hello. So today I have invited Dean Gunnerson to come have a little chat with me about Houdini. Dean is an escape artist and magician who has appeared on TV in over 165 countries performing his escapes. He's won a Merlin Award along with the title World's Best Escape Artist, a Silver Cuffs Award of Lifetime Achievement for his many extreme escapes over nearly three decades of performing, has made a Ripley's record as world's most daring escape artist, two Guinness World Records for escaping on the TV show Spectacular World of Guinness, and was the first recipient and only escape artist to ever win the Houdini Award presented on the Magic Stars television show in Tokyo. He has also been honored for his work as a humanitarian. His major stunts include Buried Alive, Cement Tomb Escape, The Challenge at Hoover Dam, Gator Bait, Airplane Jump, The Car Crusher Escape, Houdini's Milk Can Escape, Houdini's Chinese Water Torture Cell, and many more. On top of this, when I was a kid living in Winnipeg, Manitoba, he still somehow found the time to come and perform magic tricks at my fifth birthday party, which is something that I will never forget. It's safe to say that Dean Gunnarsson is our Houdini of today, which makes him a great guest to chat with for this video. So how are you doing today, Dean? Hey, great. After all, all that, it's hard to believe I'm still alive and ticking. So, <laughs> so thank you for having me on your show and happy Halloween. Yes, happy Halloween. I, I'm so happy that uh, you're able to join me for this chat about Houdini. And I know that you're really busy right now, so I appreciate the time. Oh, it's my, my pleasure. Again, I love talking about Houdini and, and Halloween is my, my absolute favorite time of the year. It's, it, it's my Christmas, so to speak. Oh yeah, me too. Absolutely. <laughs> so to touch on your uh, professional background, I'll always remember your origin story, uh, so to speak. You survived juvenile leukemia, which uh, playwright Carolyn Gray dubs as your first escape. Mm -hmm. From there, you began mirroring the training of your hero, Houdini. And can you tell us a bit about your discovery of Houdini and how he impacted you in those early years? Yeah, well, Houdini played a, a, a very significant part in my, my career and in my life. Um, when I was 10 years old, my mom bought me my very first book on Houdini. Um, and I kind of read it and got a feel of, of Houdini. It, it's, it's in my, my morgue here in a special spot. I, I, I hang on to everything. But it gave me a feel of this man that could travel around the world and get out of impossible situations. He could get out of uh, straight jackets that nobody could. He could get out of police handcuffs. He could break out of jail cells. He could hang by his ankles, you know, high in the air, get, getting out of straight jackets and things. He would jump off bridges, chained in handcuffs and escape, you know, locked in boxes, nailed on. And, and as a kid, that was like a, a comic book superhero. But yet he was a real person. He could really do these things. And I thought, wow, that would be really cool. Just like, you know, some kids wanted to play hockey or football or whatever. This, this is what I wanted to do. And so it just kind of stuck there as, as a young kid. But, but yeah, when I was 12 years old, I, I was diagnosed with leukemia and uh, given a, a, a low percentage chance of survival. And, you know, it's kind of used as a guinea pig a little bit, testing out different uh, chemotherapy treatments. And I had radiation and, and uh, I, I survived. And, but I was no longer able to play sports as I could because it made some of my bones brittle and my doctors wouldn't let me do that. So for me, rather than being this bald kid that had lost all his hair from radiation, I, I started uh, working on my magic tricks uh, at the time and, and some escapes so that I had something else to be special about. I wasn't the sick kid that was you know, gonna, gonna die of, of, of cancer. And so it gave me another outlet, another creative outlet to, to fold my, my energy and my enthusiasm, which, which I had a, a lot as, as, a, as a kid. Um, and so that, that kind of shaped it. And then through junior high and high school, I, I used to, you know, do things at school and, and escapes and shows or when the police would come, come to school, I'd 
my friends would get them to lock me up in their handcuffs and then I would I'd escape and it just kept building and building and you know helped pay my way to university and you know it was it was never easy it was always a, a struggle and you know trying as a struggling artist trying to make uh, ends meet and, and help to fill my passion of of you know, trying to buy old handcuffs and locks or Houdini books and you know but uh it 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 worked really you know really hard i did my first big publicity escape on halloween of 1982 uh from the old winnipeg free press building where houdini had escaped from back in 1923 and i i i broke houdini's record i don't know if you were there for that you would have been really really young uh, I, I was i was born in 89 but i think so, i remember hearing about it hearing about it from my parents <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that uh, they probably they didn't thoughts didn't trans transfer, but yeah, that was that was a big big moment, um, and of course Houdini passed away or on Halloween back in 1926, so so that was my first big Houdini tribute, okay. um, and it really launched launched my career. My next question, since you had mentioned uh, paying homage to Houdini in your escapes, uh, his most famous act was the Chinese water torture cell. And I remember watching mm. you perform this escape and just being terrified for you the entire time because being up, you're upside down in like a large aquarium, essentially. And I think yeah. that would be one of my nightmares. <laughs> so what was that like and how did it feel to successfully execute this iconic escape? Well, it was the, the Chinese water torture cell was was probably one of Houdini's most difficult and dangerous escapes. Uh, it was also featured in the 1953 movie with Tony Curtis, who played Houdini. And uh, I had the pleasure of, of working with Tony Curtis uh, many years ago on a, on a TV show that we were doing in Tokyo. And he, he talked to me about playing Houdini and, and, and performing the, the water torture cell. Uh, and it's a very difficult, challenging escape. Like you said, it's like a big aquarium or foam booth, and it's filled with water. You get locked up in your ankles and then you get raised high above the stage, swung over and then lowered upside down in, and locked into this giant tank of water. Actually, I, I have one right over my, my shoulder there. Oh, yeah. Uh, and that one actually belonged to Doug Henning, uh, another very famous magician and a former Winnipegger. Okay. Uh, and he used this Houdini water torture cell on his very first TV special in 1975. Uh, it closed the, the show and helped launch his, his uh, TV career. And after he performed it, he said he would never do it again <laughs> because it was so difficult, dangerous, too stressful on him and too stressful on his audience. So years later, I was able to uh, acquire it and I, I would perform it, perform it on very rare occasions in, in Las Vegas or Italy or Canada or, or uh, Tokyo and and things, but it, it wasn't my favorite escape because of the challenges. And, and like you said, it, it, it's called the water torture cell for a very good reason. It, it is torture going in the water upside down and, yeah. and being confined and not being able to reach your, your ankles or not be able to breathe and water going up in your nose. It would be a, a horrible way to die. We, we are a haunted channel, so I mm -hmm. want to get into a little bit of the spooky stuff about spiritualism. This was a major topic in Victorian subculture, and despite being mm -hmm. the world's most famous magician, Houdini was not a believer, though he wanted to be. Uh, his search actually soured his relationship with Arthur Conan Doyle when he started exposing mediums, which I'm sure you know all about. In, mm -hmm. uh, in 2007, you were involved in a play by aforementioned playwright Carolyn Gray called The Elmwood Visitation, which explored a time in 1923 when Arthur Conan Doyle traveled to Winnipeg to join the city's famous Hamilton Circle. I was lucky to see this play, and it's probably one of the things that stuck in my subconscious to inspire me to this day in my paranormal projects. So I'd, I'd love to hear your thoughts on spiritualism where Houdini is concerned and also find out about your own views on the paranormal. Well, I'm, I'm glad you got to see the play, the Elma Visitation, because it was, it was a really neat project. It was a really neat, neat play. And, you know, part of it was, was based on, on fact and, and events that happened in, in Winnipeg. 
uh, with the Hamilton house, uh, which wasn't too far from where I grew up as, as a kid. Um, but Houdini was, was uh, a crusader against spiritualism. Uh, you're right. He, he did want to believe his mother passed away uh, and he was really, really close to his mom. And he wanted to talk to her. He wanted to connect to her. So he started going to see mediums and spiritualists after she passed away. And it was, it was around the time just after the First World War uh, where mothers across North America, around the world, had lost their sons fighting in the so-called Great War. And they wanted to reach out to their moms. And it became a, a business. It became a big business of the time. So Houdini would go to these mediums and ask for communication to his mother. And what he found out, he would see objects floating around the room, uh, tables levitating, uh, ghosts appear, uh, ectoplasm coming, spiritual writings. But what he really noticed was that they weren't really being done in communication with the dead, that they were using magic tricks, mm. that variations of, of things that magicians ha have done and were doing. And this really uh, discouraged him because he really wanted to make contact. Uh, but it, it discouraged him, but it also made him angry mm. because these people weren't, weren't being truthful. They weren't being honest. Um, when you go see a magician, the magicians are one of the most honest people in the world because when you go see a magician, they're, 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 their magic is in the art that they produce. It has a rational explanation. It, it's not truly miracles, mm -hmm. um, but they do it in such a way that you're left wondering how it's done, but knowing that it's not done in, in a mystical way, uh, even though it can be presented that way as part of their, their nature. And so Houdini got really angry at these, these spiritualists and started exposing them and their, their tricks, uh, how they were making tables less levitate, how they were making ghosts appear. Uh, and he went all the way to the Supreme Court of the, of, of the United States and Congress and, and exposing this and trying to get laws to protect people from, from the fake, fake spiritualists. Uh, and they hated them because they were affecting their business and they were making lots and lots of money uh, deceiving people. So Houdini really tried, tried hard to, to find the truth. You know, I think there are things in life that we don't understand. Uh, the human mind is uh, an amazing, amazing organ. Um, you know, we can, you know, read books and, and, the words can translate these visions and these lands and these peoples and characters in a way that they become very real. Um, as, as, as an author and a writer, you know, that's what you try and do. Every yeah. time you, you, you write something is you try and make it real. You try and make the people reading it, you know, understand, relate, feel that these people are, are really there in their mind. So, you know, does, does the spirit world come back and create the same thing in our mind? Um, I think people that have had those experiences really feel that and, and believe that, um, you know, much, much like a good book or, or a novel. So, uh, you know, I, I, I believe we can have this, the, the, these feelings or these, these emotions or these, these connections. Um, but I've never seen a, a physical uh, ghosts appear. I've had things that I, I haven't been able to explain, but I've never had the, the, the experience of like a, a Casper or, or, or a, a, a person that's not here sit next to me and be able to talk to or, or, or communicate. I, I think I'm at a, a similar point with you because I've always, I've known people who will say flat out, you know, paranormal stuff doesn't exist. But there's, there's still so much in the world that's unexplained, right? And I think that there, when people say, oh, do you believe in, in ghosts? And especially since I do all this haunted stuff, I say I believe in, in something. I believe in something we haven't explained yet. So I, I think that there are very real experiences 
out there and I wouldn't discount any of it. Uh, but I just think we don't have an explanation yet. And I think it would be very interesting if uh, we could, you know, for sure communicate with people who have mm -hmm. left us at some point. I remember the first time I went to Houdini's grave site uh, in New York and uh, I had to rent a car and a driver and took me, took me there and a massive, massive cemetery s similar to what you have in Montreal. Mm -hmm. uh, and how am I going to find Houdini? And as we pulled up to the Jewish part of it, there was Houdini right front and center in this massive monument and it was closed. And I go, well, I, it's closed. How can it be closed? It's Saturday. And my manager goes, well, Houdini was Jewish, wasn't he? I go, yeah. Well, it'd be closed on the Sabbath. And it was like, oh, no. So I had to open the locks of the cemetery to sneak in to go visit Houdini because I was leaving the next day. So I couldn't come back. So I had a very spiritual presence going into Houdini's grave, grave site, uh, to, to visit him and looking over my shoulder and wonder what ill deed was going to happen, you know, breaking into a cemetery and, and, and meeting him for the first time in his resting spot. It was, uh, it was a spiritual experience that I'll, uh, I'll that's, always remember. That's it's somehow more appropriate though, than just walking in. It's like, I, I feel like you should have to, you know, <laughs> escape or, or do something, you mm -hmm. know, like it, it makes sense. Uh, that it would happen that way somehow. Right. <laughs> Speaking of ghosts, uh, my host, Dr. Mab, who does videos in French, he could not be here today, unfortunately, because of scheduling, but he did send a question along. And I have one more after this, but I think the timing is good for this one. He wanted to know, what would you say to Houdini's ghost if you met him? Wow, man, there's so many questions I have because I've I've read and studied him for, for you know, my entire adult life and, and my, my teenage life. So, I mean, it's, it would be a long, long last. I, I think he would probably get tired of it and want to go back to the other side and back <laughs> beyond. But, but I, I, I'd like to know more about, well, his great escapes, but, but more about his personal struggles, you know, how he dealt with, with becoming the most successful vaudeville entertainer in the history of vaudeville uh and that the pressure that that put on him and how he he coped with that and and how you know he managed to 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 keep going and anybody can be good once right you know you the one hit wonders but to be good for such a long time right that's mm -hmm. that really says something about houdini and houdini's career and you think about it, Houdini's been dead for almost a hundred years, but yet we're still talking about him. Yeah. We still remember him. How many entertainers do we really remember like this, right? So what was Houdini's secret? What was his real secret? Because when Houdini died, he gave all his props to his brother. Yeah. And in Houdini's will, he said, after his brother dies, all his props would be to the story. He wanted all his secrets to go into the afterlife. He didn't want anybody to ever know them. Mm -hmm. But his brother kind of came a little bit more on, on harder times, and he, he sold off or gave away all Houdini stuff. So that wish was never fulfilled. And in Niagara Falls, a lot of Houdini's props were on display there at the Houdini Magical Hall of Fame. And in 1995 the Houdini Museum mysteriously and mystically caught fire and burned down. And Houdini's most prized possession, his water culture cell, burned in that fire. Hmm. They're not quite sure how the fire started, but was that a sign from Houdini coming back to say, look, I don't want my props to be exposed anymore. I don't want them being seen by the public. This is my my wish. Uh, so maybe I would ask Houdini if he came back and lit that fire. That might have been the grand paranormal gesture you were talking about. <laughs> maybe. Maybe. Houdini was no small timer. He didn't no. do things in a small way. He did them in a great and spectacular way. In fact, even in the, the last so-called official seance in 1936, if you've listened to it, 
Houdini didn't come back to ring bells or make tables float or, or speak in tongues or some far off voice. But he, there, after the seance, there was a thunderstorm. Rain r- r- came down on the top of the roof, top of the Knickerbocker Hotel where the seance was being held. Rain that hadn't rained in, in many months before that. It was a, kind of a drought condition. And it rained for a few minutes and then stopped. So oh. in the recording, it talks about, well, would Houdini come back in such a minor way to, to ring a bell or to open up her handcuffs? He would come back in a magnificent way from the heavens and rain upon his tears upon everybody else. So this episode of Spooky Stories is going to be on YouTube October 29th as our Halloween special. And as you've mentioned a couple of times, Houdini's tragic death happened on Halloween in 1926 and was unfortunately set in motion by a Montreal student, making this a topic of particular interest for us to cover here and at this time of year. Uh, So in the 96 years since his passing, tell us a bit about finally how you and and those in your industry pay homage to the late great artist these days. Yeah. Well, again, every Halloween they do a a seances in various places to try and uh, keep Houdini's memory alive. If, If anybody can escape from the dead it would be houdini um so again this year there will be houdini seances going on i've I've been involved in several over the years um i don't know if significant things have happened to make me believe it was really houdini but some strange things have happened that you know make you scratch your head or, or wonder if that that that's really there um you know i i myself have died on halloween um you know, in, in doing another tribute to Houdini yeah. in 1983, I got locked into a wooden coffin and, and uh, thrown into the uh, icy Red River in, in, in Winnipeg. I remember and, that. Uh, rather than becoming an escape from a wooden coffin, which I, I have in the back corner over there somewhere, oh, that's yeah. the actual coffin that I died in, um, it became an escape from death. And I remember being locked underwater for like, four minutes, no breathing, you know, blue, they pulled me out. I was blue and conscious of dead. And I got to see the lights at the end of the tunnel and everything that people talk, talk about. Uh, it was very peaceful. Uh, it wasn't scary. I wasn't afraid. Uh, but somewhere in here, I, I knew I wasn't going to die. And I, I, I got sent back and came back, back to, to life. Uh, so every Halloween is important for me to do something special for, for, uh, uh, Houdini. Um, I'm just getting ready to do uh, a death defying escape uh, in the next couple of days. Um, so hopefully I'll be around on Halloween to. Uh, <laughs> to I hope so. <laughs> and do something special <laughs> with uh, uh, Houdini this year. Yeah. Uh, because, like I said, it's an important, important part of, of, of my life and, and, and many others. So. Uh, It'll be some, maybe this is the year Houdini comes back. I mean, we, we don't know. Maybe I'll do my own uh, Houdini seance here in Montreal on Halloween. Yeah. Oh, that would be great. Yeah, I mean, if you could do it even by the Princess Theater. I, now yeah. I think it's like a store. Yeah, uh, it's a fairly modern storefront. It was kind of hard for me to find when I was going to take pictures. So you don't it's... have the, the character anymore, but that location exists. <laughs> Yeah. I wonder if they would let you into the basement, into the old Maybe. dressing room. Because oh. Houdini, you know, you think he used to walk the, the doors and the alleyways. I, I, I've been there once before when I was in Montreal. Uh, and the back alley, uh, the back way is still the old entrance as it was when Houdini was there. Okay. So maybe, it's, maybe it's something on the back steps. Mm. Or, or, or like I said, if they would allow you to take a tour in the basement and and see if you get any feelings or any any vibrations or ask Houdini to come say hello yeah I'll I'll have to take a look into it for sure yeah oh yeah I I I mean I I would love love to do that myself but if but if anything happens let let me know I I I could send you some of Houdini's own handcuffs or something yeah in that 
that would, oh. that would be amazing. I, I mean, every, uh, so every video I put out, I put chapter one on the title to sort of leave it open to future investigations and stuff. So that's, uh, mm. I would love to do a part two and investigate a little bit more, do our own uh, seance and stuff. I think that'd be very fascinating. Yeah. <laughs> well, if, if, if you or anybody does see you, Dini, tell him I said hi. And I'm, I'm greatly appreciated for the footsteps that he left me to follow. They've been big footprints, but but uh, and it's always hard to escape Houdini's shadow. But it, but it's been a an honor and a privilege walking in that that shadow and and doing Houdini's great escapes and then creating my own escapes that not even Houdini the great Houdini ever attempted. But but uh, I love talking about Houdini and I love love uh, uh, sharing what I know about Houdini and uh, someday we'll meet for sure. I know that. I, I think you've done an awfully good job of following in his footsteps. Mm. Well, but thank you. I appreciate that. You're welcome. Before you go, uh, tell us a bit about what you're working on, what, what you can actually tell us about it, and uh, also let us know where our where subscribers can find you online if they'd like to follow your adventures. Mm, yeah, well, I'm on Facebook. I have like a personal Facebook and then I have World's Greatest Escape Artist, uh, Dean Gunnerson on Facebook. Um, I do have like Twitter and Instagram and stuff. I'm not quite as big into the, that, that aspect, but it's there. But there's lots of videos on YouTube of me being chained up in the coffin and dying and then putting me out or, or footage of me hanging by my toes from a trapeze getting out of a straitjacket over Hoover Dam. Uh, escaping and you know and chained and thrown out of an airplane and those kind of things. There's lots of that stuff on on YouTube if if people wanted to go and and watch. Um, I do have a big escape coming up uh, really shortly that I hope to still be around for Halloween. That I um, I'll, I'll send you an air date on that as soon as I, I hear. And I'm always working on things. I'm, I'm the book that Carolyn Gray uh, wrote. Uh, called uh, Dean Gunnerson, The Making of an Escape Artist, which talks about some of my uh, early escapes and how I got got uh, into it and, and with my friend uh, uh, Philip uh, and, and us breaking out of jail cells and things. Uh, we're working on having that put into a movie. Oh, great. Uh, we just got funding to do kind of a, a pilot uh, project for that. Uh, so that's really exciting. And I'm always working on... on you know, more, more shows. I do a lot of corporate stuff and hoping, hoping that uh, COVID uh, escapes this planet uh, soon and I can get back to China and touring uh, more around, around the world. I agree with you there. <laughs> yeah, so. oh. And then my, my webpage is uh, alwaysescaping.com. Yes. And I'll also link everything in the description down below as I always do. So people can take a look. Uh, so Thank you so much for joining me today, Dean. It's been great to well, see you. <laughs> and I, I, I really, really appreciate you being a part of Haunted Montreal's Spooky Story Sessions. Oh, it's been, been my honor. I, a great way to spend uh, Halloween. And if you or any of your guests are ever in, in Manitoba or, or near Riding Mountain where I live, if they mention your, your show, uh, that they, they saw your, your, your broadcast, I'd be more than happy to give them a, a private tour of, of the morgue and oh. all the magical things that I have here. Excellent. It's a great offer. Highly recommend taking him up on that. <laughs> okay, I guess we will uh, wrap it up and I'll hopefully talk to you again soon. Great. All right. Always remember, nothing is impossible if you truly believe. J'espère que vous avez apprécié notre petit tour d'horizon de la vie et du fantôme de Houdini. Si vous l'avez rencontré, ou si vous avez entendu d'autres rumeurs sur son fantôme, n'hésitez pas à nous le laisser savoir dans les commentaires. N'hésitez pas non plus à aimer, vous abonner et activer les notifications pour ne manquer aucune de nos capsules. D'ici samedi prochain, je vous souhaite une bonne semaine et gardez l'œil ouvert. On ne sait pas quel fantôme rôde à Montréal. <rire>